Good morning, Hylas. I didn't expect to find you up so early. It is unusual, but my thoughts were so taken up by a subject I was exploring last night that, finding I could not sleep, I resolved to get up and take a walk in the garden. Well, that was fortunate, because it allowed you to see what innocent and agreeable pleasures you lose every morning. Can there be a more pleasant time of the day, or a more delightful season of the year? That purple sky those wild but sweet notes of birds, the fragrant bloom upon the trees and flowers, the gentle influence of the rising sun. These and a thousand nameless beauties of nature inspire the soul with secret raptures. Its moods at this time are also fresh and lively and fit for those meditations to which the solitude of a garden and tranquility of the morning naturally dispose us. But I'm afraid I interrupted your thoughts. You seemed very intent on something. It is true. I was. And I would be obliged to you if you permit me to go on in the same vein. Not that I would by any means deprive myself of your company, for my thoughts always flow more easily in conversation with a friend than when I am alone. But my request is that you allow me to share my reflections. With all my heart. That's what I would have requested myself if you'd not prevented me. I was considering the odd fate of those who have, in all ages, in order to be distinguished from the common people, or from some unaccountable turn of thought, pretended either to believe nothing at all, or to believe the most extravagant things in the world. This, however, might be tolerated if their paradoxes and skepticism did not produce consequences of general disadvantage to humankind. But the mischief lies here. When people of less leisure see those who are supposed to have spent their whole time in the pursuit of knowledge professing ignorance of all things, or advancing such notions that are contrary to plain and commonly received principles, they will be tempted to entertain suspicions concerning the most important truths that they hitherto held sacred and unquestionable. I entirely agree with you about the ill tendency of the exaggerated doubts of some philosophers and the fantastic ideas of others. Lately, I've even gone so far in thinking this way that I have abandoned several of the sublime notions I received in their schools and turned to popular opinions. I give my word that since this revolt from metaphysical notions to plain dictates of nature and common sense, I find my understanding strangely enlightened. I can now easily understand a great many things that before were all mystery and riddle. I am glad to find there is nothing in the reports I heard about you. What reports were those? You were represented in last night's conversation as someone who maintains the most extravagant opinion that ever entered into the human mind. Huh? Namely, that there is no such thing as material substance in the world. Ah, I am seriously persuaded that there is no such thing as what philosophers call material substance. However, if I were made to see anything absurd or skeptical in this view, then I would have the same reason to renounce it that I think I now have to reject the contrary opinion. What? Can anything be more fantastic, more repugnant to common sense, or a... Sample complete. Ready to continue?